Hello and welcome to Fade Out TV. I'm Dominic Piper. Today I'm joined by Tim Harrison, Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. Tim, thanks for joining us. Hi Dom, thanks for having me back. Tim, uh, the last time you were in you were telling us about the, the progress you'd made uh, on the exploration front at your uh, Makutu Rare Earths project in, in Uganda. Uh, but I, I wanted to start by asking you this time around, uh, Rare Earths, uh, you know, while uh, the exploration and the mining side is, is obviously a huge part of it, it's, uh, there's so many different elements to the rare earths uh, sector, not least of all the processing and, and especially the marketing. How are you getting on with uh, penetrating that market and, and what sort of uh, feedback have you had on, on Makutu and, and what you're trying to offer? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, look, we, we've been doing a lot of work um, at, at, at looking at the supply chain and where Makutu potentially has the most value as a, as a very unique basket. Um, we've been mapping out potential opportunities across the, um, the EU and the US who are very keen for, for you know, access to a, a very unique rare earth basket like Makutu's. You know, 73% magnet plus heavy rare earths is very unique compared to all the other projects that are being developed at the moment. So, you know, we've got a very, um, a very unique basket, a, long, a large asset with the potential for a long life supply. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work now with potential partners um, in the, the, you know, the development of a rare earth supply chain to understand where we could leverage the full value of the basket. You know, potential partners, who do we work with um, to, you know, to potentially develop our own refinery and turn that into metals, um, powders, alloys, um, and, and potentially magnets with, with the right partner. So um, a lot of work going into that, that supply chain at the moment and uh, you know certainly will be a focus for the company over the next uh, six to nine months um, to you know basically be able to place our, our, our product from Makutu into a, into these new supply chains that will need to be built over the next uh, the next few years. We've seen a lot of pressure on on the supply chains for a, for a number of uh, commodities in, in uh, during the pandemic and that's obviously only increased um, since the, the crisis in Ukraine. What is driving the supply chain issues in, in rare earths? Is it because China has such a grip on supply of, of these rare earth materials? Oh, look, I think, yeah, that, that, that's a big part of it. I, but I think the other thing is that there's also gonna be substantially more demand. Um, you know, we're looking at more EVs, uh, the adoption of offshore wind. Um, we're looking at, you know, massive thematics that are going to um, require vast amounts of capital over the you know, next decade um, with substantial potential growth in, in rare earth demand and specifically the, the magnet rare earth demand. So, you know, we've seen forecasts of up to an eightfold increase in magnet rare earth requirement just for the EV requirement uh, or for the um, potential EV development through to, to the end of this decade. Um, those numbers are similar to the offshore wind sector. So when you're looking at the requirement to bring on new supplies, um, it is immense. Um, you've also got, you know, there's issues around supply chain. So uh, to, to, to build an independent supply chain uh, is one thing, but then you also want to make sure that you can build up stockpiles. So there's huge amount of investment, um, project development, especially in the rare earth space, to, to get that alternative, secure and traceable supply chains that many governments and OEMs uh, are really requiring um, in, in a very short space of time. How does that manifest, manifest itself in, in Makutu? Uh, do you then look at going downstream and, and, and refining your own product or will you work with partners or will you sell a, a concentrate offtake? Look, we, we've, from the outset, we, we've focused on developing Makutu um, to produce a mixed rare earth carbonate. Um, we want to provide as much optionality in the development approach to the project. We think there's a great amount of upside and accretive benefit for shareholders in developing our own refinery. And we've seen a lot of interest uh, from um, you know, government groups and OEMs in, in being able to secure that supply chain and um, being part of, of that supply chain. So um, 
I think, you know, we, we want to make sure we've got optionality. We're happy to work with the best partners that we can find to help bring Makutu into production as soon as possible. Um, partners that are also aligned and see the vision and the opportunity um, on, a, on a long life asset such as Makutu, which is a very rare asset, uh, being an ionic absorption clay. Um, and, you know, potentially a 50 year plus life of mine um, production capability. So, you know, there's this huge upside for the company long term in being able to develop the mine and the downstream and, and also bring on the potential for magnet recycling. You've mentioned a couple of times there the unique nature of, of uh, Makutu and its, and its mineralogy. Can you explain a little bit about what makes it so unique and why that might be an advantage for the company? So, yeah, but, so being an ionic absorption clay, um, it has a number of attributes in that uh, we're not recovering rare earth minerals. The, the rare earth minerals have already been weathered by, by Mother Nature. Um, the rare earths exist in a chemical form in the clay, which means that we can very simply um, mine the material and wash it with a salt solution. Um, the rare earths go into, into, a, into a pregnant leach solution, a PLS, and we can simply precipitate the, um, the rare earths as a, as a mixed rare earth carbonate, which is a high payable intermediate product. It's not a mineral concentrate, so it doesn't require any cracking. Um, it has you know, uh, no radionuclides. Um, so we're able to produce a value added product with you know, a, a much um, reduced um, set of parameters that mean we can go into a, into a lower capital um, downstream refining scenario relative to the hard rock projects. Um, so, you know, we're able to develop a modular project, a low capital project, producing a really high value basket. Um, so these are a number of the attributes that the ionic absorption clays have over the hard rock light rare earth dominant projects. Uh, to get to that downstream refining stage, you obviously need a mining project uh, to, to feed that. How are your exploration plants keeping pace with, with your downstream plants? Are you having success on the ground at Makoto? We just uh, recently announced the, the sixth tranche of assays from the phase four program. Uh, that phase four program we completed in, in October last year. We've just got the assays back. 432 holes were drilled in that program and uh, an amazing outcome for the company with all 432 holes coming back with rare earth bearing clays above the resource cutoff grade. So, you know, fantastic outcome. That data is now going into a, an updated mineral resource estimate update, and we're hopeful of being in a position where we'll be able to report that in the second quarter of this year. Um, best case scenario, sort of uh, later in April, and uh, we'll be able to, um, to use that as the basis for the feasibility study, which we're looking at completing later this year. So um, yeah, tremendous outcome for the company. Many of these uh, new age, new economy metals, such as rare earths and lithium and nickel, uh, end users are demanding really strong ESG credentials and, and clear transparency right throughout the supply chain. How does that fit and how, how, how are you approaching that in, in Uganda, a country which you know, essentially doesn't at this stage have a, a mining industry and, it, and it's still a developing economy? Yeah, so we've completed our environmental and social impact assessment, which was submitted uh, back in December to the Ugandan government. Um, we've had really positive feedback. Um, from the, the local districts um, and local stakeholders uh, and some of the government departments to date. So we're looking forward to getting the formal approval of that um, ESIA uh, in the second quarter of this year. Um, additional to that, we're working through other requirements for us to um, expedite the mining licence application, including a resettlement action plan, um, a lot more community engagement work, which continues to ramp up. We've got a number of community liaison officers in the project team um, that are out there, you know, making sure that we are communicating and putting the right information out to the local stakeholders. We've got really good engagement with the local Indigenous um, population in the Basoga Kingdom. Um, you know, I think we've done a lot of the good foundation work, uh, which will provide us with, a, um, you know, a lot of support in the community to, to accelerate Makutu to, towards production. In addition to that, we're also uh, about to kick off a life cycle analysis, uh, which will provide the market with a, you know, a high degree of information on the environmental benefits of, of the Makutu project 
uh, and our ability to supply the, the rare earths the world needs to, to move towards a, a net zero carbon future um, and, uh, and being able to do it in a, in a low carbon footprint environment, given that we've got access to low cost hydroelectric power immediately available to the project area. I suppose the other uh, element of, of the life cycle analysis is in, in, in the entire battery industry now I'm talking about is uh, recycling and, and the recycling of, of batteries and, and the elements within it. Can you tell me a little bit about your project the looking at the recycling of the magnets? Yeah, so we're working through the acquisition now of, uh, um, of Seren Technologies, which is a UK based company um, in, this, in the rare earth separation refining space. Um, it's a technology that was developed by Queen's University Belfast and the Queen's University Ionic Liquids Laboratories. Um, so we've had, um, I've been over there, I was over there back in February, uh, we're working through the acquisition and, and looking at plans to accelerate the commercialization of that technology, potentially a demonstration plant later this year. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've received a lot of uh, very strong interest on the technology and, and moving quickly into um, commercialising that um, potentially in either Europe or the US in 2023. Um, it's a low capital modular um, efficient process that chemically extracts the rare earths from out of the uh, spent and waste uh, magnet materials. Uh, it's a very unique technology and um, certainly you know, has, has a number of, uh, of existing players in the magnet production space um, you know, quite excited because uh, we're able to bring on low cost um, and new supply of magnet rare earths from uh, from stockpiles of waste material at the moment. So, uh, yeah, we're very excited about about the acquisition of Seren and, and the ability to move quickly into into magnet recycling. Just another element to this uh, uh, burgeoning rare earth story, Tim. Uh, you mentioned earlier on a few of the milestones you're looking at. Uh, it's probably worth uh, reiterating them. Uh, can we expect to see the resource update and the, and the feasibility study out this year? Yeah, so the plan is that we'll have that resource estimate update done uh, probably in the next uh, next few weeks. Uh, love to see that out uh, in the second half of, of April. Um, you know, we're expecting a pretty a pretty good uh, mineral resource estimate update. You know, the the um, the drill assays we've reported gives us a huge amount of confidence to to upgrade the classification of the resource, but also potentially grow the size of the resource. Um, and on the back of that, you know, we're working through the feasibility study program, which we're aiming at having completed um, before October of this year. Um, and that feasibility study, along with the SIA uh, and, and other key documents, will form uh, everything we need to submit a mining license application, which we're planning on submitting in, in October of this year. So, um, yeah, working through a, a planned and an aggressive strategy to get Makuta into production as soon as we can. It sounds very exciting. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Good luck with the, with the resource estimate and the feasibility study. And we'll uh, definitely catch up again later in the year, probably before Africa down under, to uh, talk more about the project. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.